Morning, church. My name is Garth Coop. I'm one of the pastors here at Steinbeck EMC, and it's uh, great that uh, you have joined us online. Uh, I remember about 25 years ago or so, the first time I had attended a Promise Keepers event. Uh, we, a uh, bunch of us guys, went to a Promise Keepers event in uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And uh, while I had been to lots of crusades before, lots of crusades and conferences growing up, uh, this was different to me. And I remember going into the arena. And just, uh, there was something electric about that atmosphere. Uh, we finally found our seats way up in the nosebleed section. And uh, just a powerful event where the arena full of men praising God uh, and just excited about what the weekend would hold. Uh, as I was sitting there in my seat getting ready for the event to start, uh, across the arena, uh, as I was chatting with the people around me, I heard across the arena uh, some guys shouted, God is good. And uh, I, I didn't quite catch on to what was being said because I was immersed in the conversation here. But all of a sudden, the men and, uh, around me and from our side of the arena yelled back, all the time and all the time. And then the other side of the building said, God is good. And, uh, and it kind of freaked me out. It kind of shocked me. Um, but this went on and back and forth for a while. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And it went on back and forth. And I'm thinking to myself, because this is the first time I had ever heard that, I thought, wow, this is weird. Uh, and, and yet it was kind of wild. Uh, it was kind of cheesy, and yet it was kind of contagious. And I found myself just kind of getting caught up in the whole thing. And, and, and soon I was responding, God is good. All the time and all the time, God is good. And it went back and forth. It was so good. I'm not sure if it was the Holy Spirit or if it was just the adrenaline of the moment, but it was good. God is good all the time, all the time God is good. You know what, to be transparent with you, um, it was easy for me to say it at that time in my life. It was easy to say it because things are, were going good. In fact, it's good and easy to say God is good when life is maybe characterized by comfort. When life is characterized by, oh, maybe my relationships are all good, my relationships are going well, my bank account is good, the bank statement is in black ink, and, and, and so things are good. When, when my health is good, it's easy to say, God is good. God is good all the time. But what about when things aren't so comfortable? Um, what about when relationship tensions flare up? What about when we struggle with our health? What about when, when, when maybe our job or our career isn't going so great? Maybe when life, in life we don't feel so successful and we don't feel so blessed and, and maybe our bank statement has more red in it than black. And then I wonder if we think more, hmm, is God really all that good after all? Or maybe... If you're ever in that situation, maybe you start to do a little bit what I do, and I start to wonder about the bad things in my life, and I think about maybe the things that I have done wrong in my life, and I wonder, which one of these things is the thing that finally pushed God over the edge? Is this something that God is just bringing into my life because of maybe some sin in my life? Maybe we start to take inventory in our life and we look at our things that we've done, things that we've said, and maybe we start to take an inventory and we say, well, sure, I have some sin in my life, but I haven't done anything illegal. Uh, the things that I've done in my life, they aren't highly immoral. Um, what could possibly justify the heartache that I'm going through? When we go through painful experiences in our life, they can often reveal to us how and what we think about God. One of the things that I am learning to do so that I can choose the right narratives about God is to ask myself this question. Is my understanding of God consistent with the God that Jesus revealed? It's easy, maybe it's natural for, for us when we go through trouble and when we go through heartaches in life that we ask ourselves the question, who sinned? Or what sin was it? 
that could have caused this to happen? Hmm. That question. Who sinned? That's been around for a long time. It's not just a question that I've asked. It's not just a question that maybe some of you have asked as well. Uh, most of the ancient religions were built on that narrative too that said, uh, if you do something good, well, then the gods will bless you. Or on the flip side of that is, if you do something bad, if you do something that makes the gods angry, then watch out because you are certain to get punished. But as I think about that, and I think about the ancient narratives that were built upon this false narrative, um, I know that it's not just ancient narratives. We hear this all the time. Uh, usually, I would say I hear it in the negative sense. Oh, maybe I hear stuff like, well, that's just karma for you. Or I hear sometimes, even in the hockey arena, oh, what you did, watch out, because the hockey gods are going to get you. Right? The false narrative. Not just out there, but it's also in here. It's a common narrative also that I hear amongst Christians, am among Christ followers. And in fact, if I'm real transparent with you, it's a narrative that I too have believed. And even now, I sometimes go back to that as a default. Maybe it looks something like this. That if I do something especially good, maybe if I've been praying for a long time or I've done something really good to help out my neighbor or to help somebody else in need, and I wonder, I wonder how God's going to bless me because of my good deeds. Or if, on the other hand, I, I do something wrong. Maybe, maybe I've lied to my neighbor or I've lied to my family members or to my friends. Or maybe I've skipped church to go play golf. I've never done that, right? But if I did, and then you wonder, oh, is God going to punish me for this? You could maybe sum up this belief by saying, God is an angry God. God is a God who is looking out, just waiting for us to step out of line, and then He's going to come down hard on us. The circumstances in our life can drive us to look deeply into what we really think about God. And in order to get the story right, to get the narrative straight, we need to go to the best God storyteller that we can find. And so we turn our attention to Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 17, that God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. In other words, this is a, a loose translation here, that God came down Himself to correct the intimidating things that His people had heard about Him. The God that they perceived to be distant and to be cold and to be silent came in the flesh to prove the depth of his love for humanity. So what did Jesus say about God? Well, Jesus proclaimed very boldly that only the heavenly Father was good. And as we read the stories, as we, as we read about the events in Jesus' life, we see that Jesus describes a God who seems completely good and is always out for our good, even though we can't understand it. You might ask, well then, what about the narrative that says God punishes bad people? Jesus was asked about this on two different occasions. Uh, the first one we read in, in Luke chapter 13, the first five verses of that chapter. We read this. Now, there were some present at the t that time who told Jesus about the Galileans who, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Jesus was using a current event to drive home a point to his audience. People were wondering whether those who had suffered so much, if they were being specially judged by God. 
And you can hear Jesus addressing their question, addressing their false narrative of a punishing God in the way that he answers them. When he says to them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Jesus says, absolutely not. Right? He's shutting down that way of thinking. Because if there was any connection between their sin and the punishment, Jesus could have easily just said, yes, that's exactly why they're going through that punishment. That's exactly why that happened to them. But instead, what Jesus does is he uses this tragedy not to explain how God punishes people, but to remind them that there is a result worse than physical death. That spiritual death is worse. That has eternal consequences. There's a second example, a second time we read about Jesus opposing this God punishes narrative. And it's found in John chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, and it goes on in that passage. But in here, uh, we see Jesus encountering a man who was born blind. And his disciples ask him, uh, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? You see, the rabbis in Jesus' day, they taught that illnesses were caused by the sins of the parents or of the person who was suffering. And so because this man was born blind, they would assume that blindness was because of the parents, because the parents had done something, because it was the parents' fault, or, as some rabbis had taught, the child could actually commit a sin while he was still in the womb. And so perhaps it was this man's fault, after all, that he was born blind. There was still a third view, and that was the belief in reincarnation that held that the sin in a previous life was the reason why an illness was present at birth. According to this belief, blindness was believed to, to be because the person had killed his mother in the previous life. And so it's almost like a mystery. It's almost like a mystery that we're watching on TV and we're going to commercial break, but the smoking gun is there, and then they're asking Jesus, Jesus, who done it? Who's at fault, Jesus. And before we go to commercial break, we wonder, okay, how is Jesus going to answer this question? Is he going to blame the parents? Is he going to say, yep, it's their fault? That's the reason why he was born blind? Or is he going to affirm the rabbinic position? And perhaps he's going to say, yep, he committed a sin while he was still in the womb? Or would Jesus step outside his, uh, this typical Jewish tradition? this typical uh, Jewish narrative and say that the blind man must have done something in his previous life. How would Jesus answer this? Jesus was given a glorious opportunity to affirm one of those dominant narratives that were present at the time. But he refuses to support any of them. Instead, he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That seems like a weird thing to say. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. That's weird, especially from Jesus, because I don't know anyone who is without sin. And I don't mean to sound judgmental, but seriously, none of us are without sin. Right? I hope that we can all admit that. But Jesus wasn't talking about our sins because he knows and, and we know that we, are, uh, we sin. That's not what Jesus was meaning when he said the statement, neither his parents nor this man have sinned. But he was making a statement here that there is no connection between his, the parents or this man's sin and his blindness. Otherwise, Jesus could have said, yep, yeah, that's right. It was his parents' fault. They ran after other gods, and my father is taking it out on them, and they're making, uh, and, he, and he's making his son punished, or, or punishing his child for that. Or he could have said to, to the disciples, it's the man's own fault. Yeah, when he was in his mother's womb, he had some jealous 
thoughts, and so that's why God made him blind. But again, and let me empathize or <laughs> emphasize this again. Jesus did not say anything like this. What is more? Jesus heals the man of his blindness, and the implications of this are massive, right? If Jesus believed the man's blindness was a reasonable punishment for his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus could have walked away from the situation because justice and fairness would have, fit, would have demanded it. Jesus could have walked away from this situation and he said, yep, serves him right. But instead, we read that Jesus healed the man and so he revealed the power of God, putting an end to the notion that we get what we deserve. So you see, according to Jesus, God is not some kind of cosmic scorekeeper. Nor is he in the business of balancing some eternal checkbook for us. In another place in the Gospels, um, Jesus says that God treats all people the same. When, he, when we read this in Matthew chapter 5, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus is telling us an obvious truth here. He says, just as sunshine and rain are given equally to the saints and sinners with no difference, God gives blessing to all regardless of their behavior. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. But then we ask ourselves the question, then why is this narrative of a punishing, blessing God so appealing to us? I think part of the reason is because we like control. Living in this narrative with a blessing, punishing God allows us to live with this illusion that we can control our world. If we're good, he's going to bless us. If we do bad, well, then he's going to punish us. And it sounds a little bit like we're superstitious, right? Don't walk under the ladder. Don't let a black cat cross across, uh, your path. Don't break a mirror or you're going to have bad luck. Bad things are going to happen to you if you do that. That's superstitious. And even though deep down inside we know that superstitions are silly, that doesn't stop us sometimes from believing them. We might admit with Michael Scott, I'm not superstitious. I'm a little stitious, right? St. Augustine, he was a theologian and a philosopher from the 4th century. And he pointed out, pointed out an obvious uh, truth, an obvious problem, rather, when he said this, we do not know why God's judgment makes a good man poor and a wicked man rich, nor why the wicked man enjoys the best of health while the man of religion wastes away in illness. Even then, it is not consistent. Good men also have good fortune, and evil men find evil fortunes. So though we do not know what judgment these things are carried out, by what judgment these things are carried out, or permitted by God, in whom the highest virtue and the highest wisdom and the highest justice, and in whom there is no weakness, nor rashness, nor unfairness, it is nonetheless beneficial for us to learn not to regard as important the good or evil fortunes which we see shared by good and evil persons alike. Man, I like his honesty. We do not know why God allows this to happen. And then he points out that good things happen to good people and bad things also happen to bad people. In all of this, Augustine concludes this. God possesses the highest virtue, the highest wisdom, and the highest justice. God is neither weak, nor rash, nor unfair. And then he concludes by saying that it is not beneficial for us to spend our time worrying about why good or bad things happen. It is not worthwhile because we simply cannot know them. And more importantly, they will keep us fo from focusing on the right things. Augustine encourages us, rather, we must seek out the good things that are peculiar to good people and to give the widest birth to the evils peculiar to evil men. What does that mean? It refers to the blessings that are 
given only to those who strive to do good. That is the only justice in a sense that we can count on. Uh, For example, and I could use many examples from our congregation, but as I was thinking about Augustine's comments, Albert and Edna Martins come to my mind. For years they have taken people from our congregation, many people from our congregation, to serve and to teach and to offer love to the people of Tadouli Lake, to Pangasi, and to Poplar Hill. I had the privilege of going with Albert and Edna a few years back and to watch as they walked the streets of Tadouli Lake. As they walked down the streets, men and women and children from their homes would flock to Albert and Edna, greeting them, hugging them, thanking them for the years of faithful service. And it was amazing to see their faces light up with joy. That is unknown to those who do wrong, who do evil. Those who are selfish and mean will never know the feeling that Albert and Edna know. It's something peculiar to those who do good. This does not solve the problem entirely, but it does give us a little bit of a glimpse into the goodness of God. God promises that those who who love Him and serve Him who are honest and faithful, will know a kind of joy and peace that those who are evil will never, never will. We will never know in this life why anything happens to any of us. And yet, Augustine offers one last word of wisdom about suffering. He tells us that one day we will understand. When we come to judgment day, Not only will the judgments past there seem to be most just, but all the judgments of God from the beginning will be likewise clearly fair. Then too, it will also become clear how just the judgment of God is in causing so many, in fact, almost all of his judgments to evade man's grasp of understanding. Those who have faith will not fail to realize that such hidden judgments are just. We cannot know these things here and now. They are beyond our grasp, beyond our understanding. But one day, it will become clear. One day, we will fully understand why God allowed what He allowed to come into our lives. And I believe that we will understand why we will see that God was not only just, but he was good. And so it's not just the narratives of Jesus that help us, but Jesus himself is carrying us along through our own grief, through our own doubt, through our own suffering. And as Jesus explains suffering, we also recognize in Jesus that he too experienced suffering himself. He endured the worst kind of alienation possible as he hung on the cross, feeling as if the Father had abandoned him. And so when we receive bad news, we too often feel abandoned by God. But Jesus understands. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul wrote this moving narrative. He said, I have been crucified with Christ And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I affirm with Paul that I have been crucified with Christ. I do not understand that mystery, but I know that Christ lives in me, and I live life by his faith. We are not alone. This is something more than simply just getting our narratives right, but it's allowing Christ to live in and through and for us. The love of the Father, the redemption of Jesus, and the communion we have with the Spirit are not based upon anything we do. It is a gift from the Holy Spirit to believe in a God who is good even when things look bleak. God's goodness 
is not something that we get to decide upon. We as human beings, we have limited understanding. But in the end, we have this testimony of Jesus to stand firm on. You see, Jesus never promised us that our lives would be free of struggle. In fact, he said quite the opposite when we read, I have told you these things. These are Jesus' words. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart because I have overcome the world. Uh, We should expect that we will go through heartache and we will go through pain. We will go through suffering and we will go through loss because they are, at least in part, what it means to be human. But these events can be useful in our development. James wrote these words, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I have grown through trials, probably more so than my successes. And while I do not ask for trials and and I am not as deep in God's kingdom as James was, I, I do not consider it yet as pure joy when I go through trials, but I am learning to trust God in the trials, in the midst of these trials that I go through. And so we can hold fast the hope that we have of heaven, a place where wrongs will be made right and where we will fully understand. We believe all this because of the faith of our faith in the Son of God, who loves us and gave himself for us. So that no matter where we are, we can say with confidence, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good.